If you're just getting started with kettlebells, this is the perfect video for you. I'm going to show you the ultimate kettlebell beginner's guide. We're going to take you through everything, theory, fundamentals, safety, practice, exercises, workouts, and even more. Matter of fact, I'm going to make a bold claim. After watching this video, you're going to be equipped with the most important fundamentals starters need to know. You'll also know how to program your own kettlebell workout. You'll understand the most bang for your buck kettlebell exercises, the best ones that you can do, and we're going to cover common mistakes. <laughs> Before we get started, I have a gift for you. A 30-day kettlebell challenge for free. Check the first link in the description. This is going to be a long video, so let's start with the summary first. If you want to jump to a specific section in this video, check the timestamps. In the first part, we're going to cover some basic fundamentals. In part number two, we're going to talk about important theory. Part number three is practice preparation. And part number four is practice itself exercises, training, the good stuff. The reason why I want to talk about theory and the fundamentals as well in the beginning of this video is because I want you to connect the dots when it comes to the exercises and the practice. And this is what I'm going to do. You're about to get red pilled in the world of kettlebell training. On YouTube and on social media, you'll find a plethora of kettlebell content. And lots of it is good stuff. I have a lot of friends and experts who are knowledgeable and share their insights on kettlebells on their platforms. However, there's also a lot of this and misinformation. So I'm standing in front of you as Morpheus asking you, do you want to get red-pilled and know the truth about kettlebell training? If you keep watching, I'm assuming you want to take the red pill. So let's talk about the fundamentals first. What is kettlebell training? Kettlebell training is executing mostly ballistic movements with fixed weights in moderate to high rep ranges. And we consider kettlebells the Swiss army knife of modern training modalities because it can do so much all at once. Here are 12 benefits that regular kettlebell training can provide you with. Number one, you will build muscle. Number two, you will increase your fat burning potential. Number three, you'll have a proper solution against back pain. Number four, you can improve your coordination. Number five, you can build massive endurance and strengthen your heart. Number six, you'll have your own gym. One kettlebell replaces a whole gym and its membership. Number seven, it's low impact on the joints, which means if you are banged up in the shoulder or the hips, the kettlebell is a perfect solution for you. Number eight, you'll be able to save a lot of time. Number nine, you'll engage into the ballistic element, which yields its own benefits, such as building so-called special endurance. Number 10, you will increase your biomechanical efficiency. Number 11, it can be used as a minimalist program, two exercises or even one exercise for your workout and you're good. And number 12, it's versatile and a lot of fun. So let's cover the who is who in the timeline of how kettlebells even got started. One of the first recordings that we know of, of people using weights to improve their recreational fitness was halteres and the bibon stone in ancient Greece and stone locks from China. From there, spherical weights were used on marketplaces all around the world. Next came the European strongmen who were using these spherical weights as feats of strength as recorded by historian Edmond de Bonnet. Around 1960, the first kettlebell sport competitions were held. And in the 2000s, Pavel Tatsulin, along with John Duquesne and RKC for that matter, gave birth to the modern kettlebell renaissance. Let's check out what a proper kettlebell looks like. You have the corners, which are at the top of the handle. Then you have the handle itself. And then the thing that connects the handle with the kettlebell is called the horn. And the thing in between the handle and the kettlebell is the window. Then we have the belt itself. And then we have the base. In our case, we use hollow car competition kettlebells that have a hole inside them. There are other kettlebells on the market. However, we believe that the hollow car competition kettlebell is the best kettlebell that you can use. If you're just getting started with kettlebells, as a man, you want to start with a 12 kg kettlebell. If you are a woman and you're just getting started, use an 8 kg 
kettlebell. If you are an advanced lifter as a man, you can maybe opt in for a 16 and as a woman, maybe opt in for a 12. As a woman, you don't want to go below 8 kg and as a man, you don't want to go below 12 kg. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule. However, the idea is that you want to understand how to use the kettlebell properly. And for this, we need some proper feedback when it comes to the weight. In the world of kettlebell training, we can say that there are two different styles and I'm adding the third category. Style number one is kettlebell sport, or as I'd like to call it, high volume kettlebell training. With this type of style, you can build power and so-called special endurance. Style number two is hard style, or as I'd like to call it, high tension kettlebell training. With this type of style, you can build strength and explosiveness. And style number three is the hybrid. There are many kettlebell practitioners who have gone before me using this hybrid formula of combining the best of both worlds. I'm just putting a name on it. The hybrid style embraces high tension and high volume and allows the participants to combine and ultimately profit from the best of both worlds. Its versatility and independent framework also facilitates unique and distinctive movement patterns. The hybrid style is especially useful when a single weight class is the only option. It ultimately boils down to using the most efficient exercises when it comes to the ballistics while also including powerful grinding lifts. If this sounds a little bit too confusing, don't worry. We will cover the ballistics and the grinds later in this video. Now with that being said, I just want to say one important thing and I want to keep it brief. Intent matters more than style. Let's cover some basic scientific principles. Mortara et al said in his review of kettlebell research and its implications for exercise programming. The burden of evidence in the field of kettlebell training supports the conclusion that kettlebell training can have positive effects on cardiovascular fitness, strength and power. However, the scientific literature still has numerous gaps that need to be addressed. The study Kettlebell Training in Clinical Practice by my friend Neil May says that kettlebells can be used therapeutically to treat musculoskeletal conditions although this still needs to be demonstrated in the evidence-based realm. And in another powerful study by my friend Neil May, which he called the Bell Trial, he states that the experience of the kettlebell trial participants aged 59 to 71 include statements such as, this is the best thing I've ever done, and my condition has greatly improved. The final study that deserves recognition is the kettlebell swing study by Dr. Stuart McKill, which I had the pleasure to have a conversation with on our podcast. There's a lot of stuff to unpack in the kettlebell swing study, which is outside the scope of this video. However, here's what I want to mention. The heart style swing, which we're gonna take a look at a little bit later in the video, can yield great benefits, but can also wreak havoc for people who don't have a lot of sheer tolerance in their spine. We have received numerous feedback from people who don't do well with a particular style of swing. This does not mean that you wanna avoid the kettlebell swing altogether if you're having back pain. However, if you suffer from these pain points that I just mentioned in this particular style of swing, I wanna show you some great variations later in the video. Let's cover some important kettlebell theory. There are seven human movement patterns that we want to engage in whenever we train. And these movement patterns dictate what kind of exercises you want to use in your workout protocol. The first human movement pattern is push. For example, a press. The second is pull. For example, a row. Number three is the squat. For example, a goblet squat. The next one is the hinge. I would say one of the most important movement patterns also in kettlebell training. And we will cover the hinge with a swing. Number six is carry variations. This can be a carry where you carry the kettlebell in the rack position where your hip or the bony structure carries the weight or you can have it right here as a suitcase walk. And finally, we have rotation and anti-rotation. For example, a windmill. So as you can see with these seven exercises, a press, a row, a squat, a swing, a farmer's walk, and a windmill, you will cover all seven movement patterns, and therefore, you have yourself a great 
workout. Speaking of training and workouts, there are a couple of variables that you can adapt, change in order to suit your needs. Number one is the weight. You can choose a heavier or a lighter weight. Number two is the amount of sets and reps. Do more sets, do more reps, engage into more volume or less volume, more explosiveness or more strength. Number three is you can increase or decrease time. Maybe I wanna engage into a five minute clean and press, maybe a 10 minute snatch, maybe a one minute deadlift. Number four is tempo, also dubbed as RPM, reps per minute. Let's take for example a clean and press where I wanna do nine reps per minute then I have to work faster. Or I say four reps per minute, then I go slower. You can also choose to work out with double kettlebells. And I have even some crazy friends who use three, four, or five kettlebells all at once. And the last variable is the exercises, of course. You can choose from a broad selection of powerful and most bang for your buck exercises. Let's check out the different training styles. We can work out for time. Let's say one minute of the hand-to-hand -hand swing. No counting, just moving. Number two is four reps. We can say, you know what? Let's just do 10 deadlifts. Number three is the AMSEP method for time, where I can say I have three exercises, a deadlift, a row, and a press. I set the timer for six minutes. And once I've done all three exercises, I have one set, and I do as many sets as possible in these six minutes. The next one is every minute on the minute, where we say, you know what? I start the timer, boom, it starts running. 59, 58, 57, and I do 10 swings. And let's assume this is number 10. And now I park the bell, and now I maybe have 40 seconds remaining on the clock, and this is my rest. And once the next minute starts, I engage back into these 10 swings. The next style is using a flow technique where I combine two exercises into one. For example, a press with a overhead squat. I can also build a complex. This is where I chain multiple exercises together for various reps. Let's say five rows, five deadlifts, five press, five swing, five snatch. And then I do it all with the left side and then I do them all with the right side. A common question that we often hear is, how many times do I have to work out per week? Here's what I want to say. Your frequency over the year is more important than your frequency over the week because consistency is king. And I can tell you from experience, most of our clients who train with us in the gym come once a week. Depending on your goal, your workout can last 10 up to 45 minutes. I believe there's a sweet spot in between 20 and 30 minutes. Now, before we start training at all, we wanna move safely without any loads first. I have taken this great mantra or the philosophy from Gray Cook, where he says from functional movement systems, move well and then move often. We have added move well first and then move often under load. So move well first can mean that you want to understand how a proper hinge works in order to open up your hips and then you use a stick to give you proper feedback. Maybe you wanna circle around your shoulders to open up the shoulders, give them a little bit more mobility and flexibility in order to be able to go into the top fixation. If we want to learn a goblet squat, we want to make sure that we're able to keep our upper body as upright as possible, which requires some hip mobility and some back strength. Now I also know for a fact, and science even proves this, is that if you start working out with kettlebells, your mobility, flexibility will improve automatically as well. However, if you are experiencing some serious obstacles in your shoulders and hips, it might be worth your time to get them sorted out first. This doesn't mean that you have to spend hours on end on your mobility. It just maybe means that you maybe have to improve your technique or you have to get rid of a problem that's holding you back. Now here, I wanna share with you our classic workout philosophy. We also use different types of training methodologies, but this is one of the simplest 
forms that you can use, copy it, understand it, and just insert your exercises. So here's how the system works. You have three exercises that you do for two minutes each unbroken. This equals six minutes of volume. Now we add one minute of rest after those six minutes, and then we have one round, and you wanna do two, three, up to four rounds. Now here's a strategy that you can use in order to progressively overload your system. This is a very complex term, but what it actually means is just using different methods to improve your strength, build more muscle, improve power and endurance. The first method is increased time. Let's say you wanna improve your endurance, you're working with a two minute swing, and now you do two minutes and 30 seconds of the swing, and maybe up to five minutes. Number two is you wanna increase your RPM or your speed. Like we've talked about earlier, maybe your goal is now to do 10 clean and presses in one minute, so that's a 10 RPM. Number three is you wanna decrease rest. Maybe you wanna engage into a marathon, where you say, I wanna work out continuously for 30 minutes up to one hour. Yes, it's possible, we did this too. And finally, you can increase weight, which is self-explanatory. At this point, I wanna briefly mention the concept of special or hybrid endurance, which is the term that I've read for the first time in Thierry Sanchez's master thesis about kettlebell training. He says, kettlebell training, especially get a boy sport or kettlebell sport, requires a special hybrid of strength endurance that is specific to the sport. The East Europeans call it special endurance. This is seen by many authorities as one of the main qualities of a Gidevic. Gidevic is either the kettlebell sport athletes or you and me, folks, who use kettlebells for training. Strength endurance, as defined by conventional strength training, loads 40 to 60% of the one rep max for 20 to 40 reps, is not a guarantee of achieving good results. The duration of strength endurance exercises rarely goes over three minutes and repetitions are continuous. Research shows that strength endurance only allows an athlete to work at a fast pace for one to three minutes before performance decreases. This is a general description of what strength endurance is understood as of today. In kettlebell sport, however, kettlebells are lifted over 100 times in a period of 10 minutes. What this essentially means is that, yes, we understand how strength endurance work. However, in kettlebell training, you see folks with my body weight, 70 kilograms, using double 32s, 64 kg, doing a long cycle up to 80 to 90 reps for 10 minutes. That's why in kettlebell training, you engage into special or so-called hybrid endurance. And this is probably the so-called what the hell effect that Pavel Satulin has coined. I call this type of kettlebell training the tides that lifts all boats of physical qualities. Now it becomes a little bit practical. You want to understand how you can grab the kettlebell for different and various exercises. Grip number one is a thumb grip a grip that we recommend beginners to understand first. You insert both of your hands inside the window of the kettlebell and your fingers grab the belly of the bell. Now in order to clean the kettlebell up, you wanna pull the kettlebell between your legs, pull it up, insert both of your thumbs like this. Now the kettlebell makes contact with your chest and your fingers and wrap or close the kettlebell. Now from this position, you can start pressing or clean and pressing. And pressing is one of the fundamental exercises that you will do in kettlebell training. Grip number two is the finger grip. This is where you grab the kettlebell, not in a crush grip like this, but you grab the kettlebell very loosely inside your fingers. This is a grip that you use for the swing, clean and snatch. Next up is the hook grip, an important fundamental of kettlebell training that you need as the base for many exercises. It looks like this, one, two, three. As you can see, I insert my full wrist inside the window of the kettlebell. Part of my forearm makes now contact with the horn and my web space connects with the handle. Now I close my fingers to a fist and I rack the kettlebell on my body. And from this position, I can press the weight overhead. The next grip is the goblet grip and there's two variations of it. Variation number one is like this. I grab the kettlebell by the bell itself and now I can go down into a goblet squat. I can also grab it like this, where I enclose the kettlebell with my forearms and I grab it by the horns and squat down like this. And we also see some of our clients use a grip like this, where they can shift the kettlebell a little bit forward, which makes it easier for you to keep an upright back. Chalk can be used to improve your performance with kettlebells, especially in the ballistics. It prevents your arm from fatiguing because you have to grip or grab the kettlebell too hard. Remember the finger grip, 
The idea of the finger grip is to grab the kettlebell in a way that doesn't burn out your forearms. If you haven't improved your technique yet to a point where you are advanced or professional, do not use chalk because this increases friction. And if your technique isn't proper, you'll turn your hands into hamburger meat. Wrist orientation is important in the ballistic exercises like the swing, the clean, or the snatch. The first variation is the front hand, where you swing the kettlebell like this so that your thumb always is pointing upwards. Works for the clean and also for the snatch. The next grip is called the backhand. This is where your thumb is pointing slightly towards your hip. It also blends together with the transverse hand because as you are switching hands, you switch the kettlebell approximately on a transverse level where you grab the kettlebell like this and once it drops back into the backswing, you turn your thumb a little bit towards your hips. Looks like this. Works also for the clean and for the snatch. Now what happens if you turn your hands into hamburger meat like here or the clean in the rack position really bust up your forearm. There's only one solution, improve your technique. And part of this type of discomfort is necessary in order for you to grow and improve your skill. So don't worry if your hands and forearms are a little bit busted up in the beginning, it's normal and we have all been through it. We're getting closer to practice, which some of you who have been watching until now are probably eager to try out. So let's cover safety first. Safety rule number one is the bell always wins. Do not try to fight with it. If the kettlebell wants to go one way and you want to go the other, let go of it and step aside. Number two, you always want to stay focused. There's a pandemic going on right now in commercial gyms all around the world that people are always hanging on their phones like this. The beautiful thing about kettlebell training is that it doesn't allow you to pick up your phone when you start working with it. This doesn't mean, however, that you don't lose focus. So make sure you're always zoned in. Number three, your setup and your stoppage is your first rep. What does it mean? For example, with the clean and press, my setup is like this. So this is my first rep. Let's assume I'm finished with the exercise. I don't drop the kettlebell like a bag of rice, but I stop it properly. Number four, understand how to move weights. You don't want to bend your back and lift weights like this because many people, we see it in practice, when we train with them, they have a proper deadlift stance. And when we say, okay, we can now drop the kettlebell and now put them away back into the rack, they do this. Don't do it. Always stay focused and understand how to properly move weights. And the next one is hands-free, which is self-explanatory. When you train with kettlebells, I don't want to see no rings, no bands, no watches. Safety rule number six, you either want to train in flat shoes or barefoot. The shoes that I am wearing right now is from our own brand. We call them flat kicks. Minimalist shoes that are awesome to train with and that feel like you wear no shoes at all. Plus they got some spikes, which is great if you want to run on the track. They're currently in testing phase, so like and subscribe to this video if you want to stay informed when we put these up for sale. Safety rule number seven, you should always make sure that there's enough space around you. Make sure no kettlebell is right behind you. Because if you're focusing on one thing and maybe you trip or you'll take a step backwards, boom, you trip over a kettlebell and these are nasty. Their relationship with gravity is intact. The next one is good flooring. We have solid rubber flooring in our gym. So the kettlebell can drop like this and it doesn't hurt the floor and it doesn't hurt the kettlebell. Number nine, you want to respect the weight. If you see this big boy right here in the back, we call it the Death Star or the Fat Boys. This is a 64 kg kettlebell. If I tell you to pick up this 64 monster, you will be very careful. And this is exactly how I want you to treat even the lightest ones that we have, an 8 kg. Always respect the weights. And the final point we've already touched upon it is discomfort versus pain. Discomfort and even making mistakes is necessary because it allows us and shows us to adapt and to improve. And this is how we can ultimately grow. Pain, however, might be a signal that we went a little bit too far. There are three categories in kettlebell training. Number one is the grinds. These are exercises that, as the name implies, require a lot of grinding, a lot of tension, a lot of strength, 
a lot of static movements. Category number two is the unique selling point or the USP of kettlebells, ballistics. This is where the kettlebell shines the most and with it, its unique benefits. And then we have category number three is doubles, working out with two kettlebells. Let's cover breathing and its variations real quick. Number one is natural breathing. This is how you breathe normally when you start lifting with kettlebells. Now, even if your breathing might be wrong, doesn't matter because you want to engage into natural breathing because first you have to focus all of your brain power to learn the exercises. Then there's recuperation. It's a specific breathing technique that you can use to regenerate as fast as you can. Number three is we call HERP, hyperrhythmic breathing. This is a breathing technique that is unique to kettlebell training and the one that you want to opt in for once you have mastered all the fundamentals or most of the exercises. And the last one is the Valsalva maneuver, where you breathe in, hold the tension for a second, press the weight overhead, which gives you more stability and more strength. A good warm up should include four distinct aspects. Number one, it should mobilize your joints. Number two, it should help you increase your flexibility. Number three, it's supposed to get your synovial fluids going and increase your heart rate. Number four, it should be long enough to allow you to switch from your daily routine into training. If you're looking for a proper warm up, check the link right here. Now we've already talked about the hinge, so let's cover it in more detail. Here's how you do it. You push your hips back, your upper body leans forward, you keep your arms at your sides, knees are unlocking a little bit, and you keep your spine straight. You want to reach this bottom position where you feel a lot of tension in your hamstrings, and now you come back up. You need to understand and master the hinge first, because as you will see in a moment, it's included in almost every exercise. Now let's cover the grinding lifts or the grinds, one of the three categories of kettlebell exercises. Exercise number one is the deadlift. Shoulder width stands over the kettlebell. We hinge, upper body leans forward. I grab the kettlebell with my straight arms, pull my shoulders back. Now I stand up and back down. Exercise number two is the goblet squat. You place the kettlebell half a meter in front of you, swing it between your legs, grab it in a goblet grip. Now, hinge a little bit, push the knees out, keep your chest up, squat down, and come back up. Exercise number three is the reverse lunge. Clean the kettlebell up like in a goblet squat, shoulder width stands. Take one step back, down on your knees, and back up. One step back, touch down, Back up. Exercise number four is the row. I stand shoulder width apart over the kettlebell. I hinge, grab the kettlebell with one arm, and now I pull the elbow up close to my hips. Switching sides. Exercise number five is the press. I'm gonna show you the double-handed version first. Jump into the thumb grip, grab the kettlebell, elbows close to the body, handle makes contact with the chest, press the kettlebell overhead. Here's the single hand version. Insert your hand inside the window of the kettlebell. Keep the elbow close to the body. Now press up from this position. Exercise number six is the windmill. I snatch the kettlebell overhead. We're gonna cover the snatch in a second. One, two, three. Now it's in the top fixation. Now both of my feet, I point them to the left side. Now I side hinge. Push the hips to the right side. My T-spine rotates now to the front. I look up to the kettlebell, reach down for the floor, and come back up. Exercise number seven is the Turkish get-up, and it requires a little forward. It's actually a flow of different exercises into one. The idea is the following. In a standing position with a kettlebell overhead, we wanna lay down on our backs and then stand back up. I like to start with the Turkish get up overhead. Go into a curtsy lunge. Open up the hips. Reach down for the floor. Bring my rear leg to the front. Down on the hips. Down on the elbow. Distributing my weight between my right leg and my left elbow and going down on my back. Arm comes down, kettlebell touches the chest. Breathe, press the weight back up. Swivel around the kettlebell by shifting the weight from my right 
foot to my left elbow, up on my hands. Now hips go up, I pull my leg in and rotate the hips. Now I shift my whole body weight towards my left foot and turn around and stand up. The final exercise is the farmer's walk. Low tech, doesn't require a lot of skill and still yields a lot of results. You lift both kettlebells and then you start walking and keep your upper body straight and the shoulders back. Now let's jump into the ballistics and let's cover the kettlebell swing. I'm gonna show you three popular variants. The first variant is a hard style swing where we use heavier weights, use both hands and work on our explosiveness. The second variant is a hand to hand or hybrid swing where we still use some explosiveness but we decrease the energy a little bit so we can swing for longer sets of time. And the final swing variant is the Russian pendulum or the kettlebell sports swing. Although you can use the final variant as an exercise per se, the idea behind it is the Russian pendulum that is most commonly used in the clean and the snatch. With the hard style swing, I'm using a 32 kg kettlebell. Shoulder with stance, I hinge, grab the kettlebell, have a straight back, tilt it towards me so that the base is off the floor. Now I'll pull the weight between my legs and hip thrust it upwards. Variant number two, the hybrid hand-to-hand -hand swing, has a similar pattern. Hinge, grab the kettlebell, tilt it towards me so that the base is off the floor, and now I switch hands at the top. The major difference between the two is we're using a unilateral aspect of training, which means we're working with one arm and then with the other, which creates a so-called cross-training or cross-education effect. The final variant is the kettlebell sports swing. Before I demonstrate you the exercise, I want to explain the Russian pendulum. Here's how it works. I pull the kettlebell between my legs, making contact, and now as soon as I make contact, I straighten the knees. Then I bend the knees and now I extend the hips. Kettlebell starts flying. I wait until the arm comes back and the kettlebell comes back, makes contact with the body. I catch it with my quads by bending the knees. Now I am flexing the hips and extending the knees. Then I come back, boom, boom, slow motion. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Watch. Now let's cover the clean and by extension, the clean and press or push press and the clean and jerk. Make sure that your kettlebell swing is down pat because every mistake that you make in the kettlebell swing will be transferred into the clean and into the snatch. The major difference between the swing and the clean is as I'm pulling the kettlebell between my legs, I don't hip thrust the weight upward and let it fly, but I hip thrust the weight upward and then I pull the arm close, insert my hand inside the window of the kettlebell and rack the weight close to my body. Looks like this. Once we have mastered the clean, we jump into the push press and the jerk because the strict press is already part of the grinding lifts. Now with the push press, I'm doing the following. I'm dipping the knees forward and now I go into quadruple extension, extending the feet, knees, hips and my upper back or my spine. This quadruple extension transfers movement energy into my arm and by extension the kettlebell, which helps to press the kettlebell overhead. With the jerk, we follow the same movement patterns like in the push press. We have a dip, we have quadruple extension, we send the kettlebell flying, but before it lands overhead, we fall into the second dip and then we stand up. Looks like this. There's two major differences between the jerk and the push press. A, we give our legs some additional rest, and B, 
we decrease the distance that the kettlebell has to travel. The conclusion of the ballistics and the final exercise is the snatch. We follow a similar movement pattern like in the clean. The only difference is now the kettlebell doesn't stop at the hip and we don't bend the arm, but we keep our arms extended and we stop overhead. Advanced practitioners use their upper body as leverage to heave the bell up and drop it back down. Watch. Here are a couple of drills to help you master the most powerful and most bang for your buck exercises that you can do with the kettlebell. Drill number one is mastering the single hand swing before you're switching sides. And the single hand swing looks like this. The next drill is called hand to hand clean. It helps you to master your hand insertion. This is what it looks like. The final drill is a high pull turning into a clock snatch to master the snatch. This is what it looks like. Get used to the height that the kettlebell has to travel for the snatch. And now start inserting your hand as early as possible. The snatch is such a complicated exercise to learn, so you want to take it step by step. With the half snatch, we eliminate the hardest phase, the drop, and we only focus on the kettlebell going up. Watch. In the rack. Breathe. In. Now let's cover the most common mistakes of the grinds and the ballistics. As a side note, there are a lot of mistakes that you can do. So for brevity's sake, I'm only focusing on the most important ones. The most common mistake in the deadlift is a rounded back. Remedy this by keeping the spine straight. The most common mistake in a goblet squat is leaning forward as you go down into the bottom position of the squat. It may be that you are not yet strong enough in your back area. So try to make sure that you stay as upright as possible and maybe push the kettlebell a little bit outwards to help you for counterbalance. The reverse lunge has a similar problem to the goblet squat and that is leaning forward as we go down into the bottom position of the lunge. And the second most egregious mistake that I see is standing on a tight rope and then losing balance. Make sure you are standing on tracks and keep your upper body as upright as possible. With the roll, we have a similar mistake in the deadlift, a rounded back, and instead of pulling the elbow close to the body, people are pulling the elbow away from the body. The single hand press is a little bit more complicated, and the biggest mistake that people make is not having a safe and proper hand insertion. Instead, they have the kettlebell like this. Make sure you are inserting your hand as deep as possible inside the window of the kettlebell. The second mistake is not pressing up in a straight, straight line, but pressing up away from the body, which costs unnecessary effort. The biggest mistake in the windmill is lacking kinesthetic literacy in the hips and maybe some mobility. And then people just try to bend over like this, and then they wonder why it's not working. Think about this side hinge and T-spine rotation. These two moves have to be in place in order to engage into a safe and proper windmill. The getup is unfortunately littered with traps. That's why people make a lot of mistakes. The biggest mistake that I see, however, is from this position, trying to get up and only pulling the leg backwards and not being able to rotate fully. Think about this, you pull the leg backwards and you rotate the hips. In the farmer's walk, aside from not lifting the kettlebells up in a safe manner like you would in a deadlift, is people start walking like the hunchback of Notre Dame. Try to stay as upright as possible. The major mistake in the swing is being too arm dominant. So instead of using the hips to catapult the weight upwards, and think about this great cue that I want to mention in place right here. Think about stabbing the hips into the floor to activate your hips. And if you don't do this, you start pulling the kettlebell from your arms and it looks like this. 
instead of like this. Another important mistake in the swing is missing the timing. So as the kettlebell drops back into the backswing, don't hinge too early. Wait for the arm to reconnect with your body and then hinge. With the clean, we see overlapping mistakes that you see in other exercises as well. A, we're too arm dominant, so we try to pull the weight up with the arm, and then B, not jumping into a proper hand insertion. So take your time, use your hips, step the feet into the floor, insert the hand inside the window of the kettlebell, and rack it close to your body. In the push press and the jerk, people make a lot of mistakes. But the most frequent one that I see is losing contact between the elbow and the hips. You want to make sure that this contact is always given because this is how you transfer the energy from your hips into your arms. And if I have the arm out here, I am wasting energy. Maybe yes, there's coming a little bit energy from the legs, but if I have the arm connected, I'm able to distribute the energy way better and use this power to bring the kettlebell overhead. One of the hardest things to learn in the jerk is bending the hips and the knees while extending the arm at the same time. Then people do this. Patience and a lot of reps is the key. With the snatch, we make the same mistakes like in the clean. We are too arm dominant and we don't have a proper hand insertion. However, another major mistake is bending the arm as the kettlebell goes up. We say once the elbow bends, the power ends. So on your way up, you keep the arm straight, you lock it overhead, and when you drop it, this is where you are allowed to bend the arm again. As a bonus, let's cover the most bang for your buck exercises with doubles. Every kettlebell exercise trains the full body and it requires a lot of skill. So take your time, be patient and tap into the best potential that you have ever experienced when you pick up a kettlebell and make yourself a machine. Here's the next thing that you have to do, like the video, consider subscribing, share it with a friend and if you made it this far, consider becoming a Leberstock member and join the house of Stark. Exclusive workouts, exclusive skill content, exclusive challenges, exclusive live workouts where I'll get to know you on a personal level where we train together. It's so awesome. So check it out by clicking on the button right here.